This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. Greetings, hope you're well. I've got a cracker of a conversation to share with you featuring Derek Boyer from the mighty Suffocation. The catalyst for the chat is due to the launch of the group's second ever live album. It's titled Live in North America. And if you're yet to hear it, please get in touch with me if you have heard a better live extreme metal album. The lads have just knocked it right out of the bloody park on this one here, let me tell you. Apart from the talking about the live album, I'm a bassist, Derek's a bassist, so we talk about bass, bass, bass. He even sent me through some pictures of some designs that turned into a reality for a new bass guitar. Amps feature as well, a few other things. If you're a musician, but more specifically a bass guitarist, you're going to love this conversation. Before we dive in though, I want to give you a sample of the live album. This is a tune titled Funeral Inception. Once it's done, we'll dive into the chat. How you going, mate? Hey, how's it going? I mate. love that about Australia. It's how how you going, not how you doing. I love that. <laughs> how you going? I'm like, how am I going? I guess I'm going well. I'm going good. <laughs> how you going? Mate, all these little cultural inflections that we have, we don't realize that we... Uh, it's funny. Yeah. We've got... It's like, know? no, how you doing? No, how are you doing? Not how you going, but it's the same thing in the end. I love it. How's, how's it going, bro? Cool, brother. Yeah, no, it's good. I'm glad to be talking to you. It's been, I tell you, it's been a busy week for Nuclear Blast artists. I've uh, spoke yeah. to the guitars from a pathology yesterday. I've got Gary Holt tomorrow and I've got you now. So it's nice. great. It's killer. Nice, nice. Yeah, I was just looking over the Nuclear Blast schedule and it's very busy. I think the pandemic kind of you know, shocked a bunch of bands into doing stuff, you know, rather than being on the road there, you know, doing the studio thing. And so a lot of new releases, a lot of new press, you know, it makes sense. How's that been for you guys, given that, um, you know, the touring thing, because that's your life. Right? We're, we're horrible. You know, we're an old school band. We're not a big fan of the new internet sensation success that so many of these young bands are doing. We're like, we're old school. We want to go hit the road. We want to play the shows and earn our spot. We don't want the, oh, wow, these guys got a lot of hits on YouTube. That That's not real to us. And I know that it's very relevant in this day and age. You have to have a web presence and a YouTube channel that's successful. And we're just not that band. We're just the old school band. Every couple of years, we'll give you a record and we'll go around the world a couple of times to support that record. And it's just, man, we did not utilize this free time properly. I mean, we, uh, we wrote material, which was very good, mm-hmm. but... Uh, you know, we'd rather be on the road than in the studio. And, you know, with the option to be on the road being taken away from us, I feel like in my personal experience, in my personal standpoint, I just felt depressed rather than going, hey, this is a great time to get on YouTube. I just went, fuck, this sucks. You know, we can't play. It's been 20 months. We got we got interrupted in the middle of a European tour and it was like, everybody go home. And we're like, what do you mean? And they're like, well, there's a worldwide pandemic. Get get to your homes. And we were mm-hmm. in Europe and it was like, fuck this. You know, so I stayed back in Germany with my girl for three months, actually got trapped, <laughs> which oh, wasn't right. the worst thing. Yeah. But uh, got stuck in uh, Europe for about three months uh, when the whole thing hit. And like I said, it was actually pretty nice. <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day, this whole thing of, uh, you know, being being 
forced to not be able to play the shows, you know, it's a nightmare to, to a band like us is what we do, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. There's, there's you and a bunch of others that fall into that category. It's uh big time. I think the old school bands. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and when you say you, you didn't, you don't feel like you, as though you use that time um, to be productive. I think a lot of other bands for, were in the same category too. I mean, what are you supposed to oh. do? I mean, I mean, you, you're effectively, you're a musician, sure, but you're a professional tourist. That's what you do. Right, right. We like to perform and that was taken from us. So it, it was depressing, you know, and I think it's just about to start. Uh, November, we have four shows. So we just got to basically make it through October. And uh, we just, you know, with Nuclear Blast, we're going to do a record. So it's time to buckle down and, you know, we got about half the new album done and it's like, okay, let's crank on some more material. And then, uh, you know, November we've got shows and, you know, hopefully the whole thing fires back up. You know, we're supposed to be back in Europe for a one-off in December and that'll kind of be the test, you know, like can yeah. we successfully cross the ocean and perform playing here in the U S uh, we just saw DSI do it. Internal bleeding did it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's possible on home turf, and uh, we're in another totally fucked up position. Our drummer's Canadian. And, uh, you know, the most we've ever waited for a work visa was a month and a half. You know, you mm -hmm. pay all this money and they process a paperwork that says this Canadian can come to the U.S. and earn money, you know, to do everything legit. The last thing we need is, you know, him to illegally cross the border and earn money and then get in trouble. Yeah. And we've seen other musicians come and play the U.S. without work papers and get banned. And so the last thing we need is our drummer to be, you know, yeah stricken from from the u.s so you know basically they didn't process his visa we had to cancel the show last month now we got november shows coming we stopped that process and we paid the whole expedite fee it's like fucking thirty five hundred dollars to expedite his work paperwork and it's like what happens if it still doesn't get processed now what we're gonna have to cancel all the november shows too like this is crazy so the pandemic has made it just a nightmare for us, you know, like if, if we were all American or all Canadian or all European, maybe it would be a little easier, but you know, the band's an American New York band and we got a Canadian drummer mm. and he's not far from us. He can get to us in a, you know, quick, he can just cross the border and drive right down. But the fact that he doesn't have his work papers. So we're now at the mercy of waiting on his work papers. And what we don't want to do is, you know, go play these first shows back with a fill in drummer. Cause we've already talked about it. Wow. Can Dave Cole Ross come back? Can Kevin Talley come back? You know, who, who knows the material, who's good enough, who could hop in and do the job. But we're like, man, after, you know, almost a two year hiatus, kind of the last thing we want to do is show up with the wrong lineup, <laughs> you know, like, holy shit. You know, we want to show up with our guys, not a fill in. You know, there's no doubt. Yeah. There's no doubt. Yeah. Great insight. Thanks mate. Yeah. On that yeah. one there. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's a shit of a thing, this whole thing in uh, just offering my two cents on the political yeah. motivations behind the pandemic. You know, I think for the first couple of months when we didn't understand or governments didn't understand the right. uh, what was going to happen when people became infected, but now that it's abundantly clear, something like 7 out of 10, 70% of them have been done, got the vaccine twice and even the boosters I Already. understand. So yeah. we're in a position where, and, and, and it's got to be said too, that the people, the, the comorbidity factor hasn't been taken into account here, okay? So the people that are dying from COVID, they've usually got something else as well, like 99% exactly. of the time. I understand that. Right. Look, it's very hard to get statistics on this because, of course, there's a lot of obfuscation with the social media platforms. But Crazy. It just, it just feels like uh, I'm not a conspiracy theorist at all, I'll be upright right. with you now on that point. But it just feels right. like as if it's been an opportunity to exert a whole bunch of control for not not for no valid, particularly valid reason. They want control for some reason, right? Yeah, for some reason. And it's like, why do you want to control this? Is it a, why do yeah. you need to control mass control of these populations? It's it's just that, that, the, the, those percenters, those percentage of people that are in power feel they need absolute power for some strange reason like get on with your life do something for yourself why do you need to control others but you know this could very very easily like you said without going into conspiracy this could very easily be a control issue you know they want to get everybody under their thumb and say you know you're going to be vaccinated and we're going to put whatever we want in this vaccine and you're going to get it we're seeing mandates you know these people you don't get the shot you're fucking fired 
you know, doctors, yeah. lawyers, you know, like important people, you know, getting, you know, saying, Hey, I don't want to get this. I don't want to get the shot. And the next thing, you know, they're losing their careers. So mm. who knows, you know, who really knows the whole thing. It's, I just want to play some damn death metal. <laughs> you do. And and look, I've got to say, I, I do love this, this live album here. You guys have always mm-hmm. been an exceptional live outfit. So live in North America, that's the name of suffocation mm-hmm. second ever live album. Um, and I suppose it's a commemoration in some ways of Frank's final shows. But I, th- I think it's a bit more than that in that it just demonstrates and articulates your significant live performance chops as a band. There's very few bands out there that are like you guys. So Yeah, we're one of those live ones. Yep. Definitely. Thank Thank yeah, you. yeah. Look, well, prior to recording the shows, did you have a live album in mind or did you have a listen back no, to the tapes? You know, it was one of those things where where Frank we'd known Frank's been kind of trying to retire for a long time. You know, he's got a really good state job where, you know, he's working on a pension, retirement, all this stuff. And, you know, we're a longstanding band. And uh, Frank's like, look, I don't want to be doing this when I'm 70, you know, and he's like 50, you know, or whatever. And so, you know, the rest of us were like, we can keep doing this. We still have it in us. But Frank kind of just been saying, like I said, for a while, Hey, I want to wrap this up. Hey, I want to wrap this up. And uh, I got the idea that um, the guy who was doing our live sound had the capability to record multi-track every night. So, you know, every night after the show, he'd hand me a file and it would be, you know, kick drum, snare drum, toms and hi-hats, all individual tracks, just like you would record in the studio. Hmm. And uh, we would sit back and, you know, do a rough mix and listen to it and go, oh man, we played super good, but, uh, you know, uh, the microphone got unplugged on this, blah, blah, blah. Okay. This show is no good. And this show, man, everything went great, but we kind of didn't play with the fire that we'd like to, you know, want to portray. And just the particular show in Cambridge, everybody was on fire. Nothing went wrong majorly, you know? Mm-hmm. So we were like, okay, this is a good, this is a good show. Let's get this out. Let's get this mixed and uh, presented it to nuclear blast. And they were like killer, you know, and it's a good, it's a good sign off for Frank you know, to be a farewell. It was kind of Frank's North American farewell tour. And the fact that we happened to, you know, capture a a great performance that represents what the band is. And, you know, we probably could have put out a number of those shows and it would have had the same effect, but there was just something magical about that one particular show. And like we were saying, you know, we wish, you know, CDs and albums were longer because we had to take down all of the banter, you know, and Frank's pretty much known for all his bullshit that he says between songs. We had to remove that. You know, some of these, we couldn't even, I think with the album, the vinyl, they were like, Hey man, the whole thing doesn't even fit. Like, uh, are you willing to cut songs off of the show to make it fit on an album, on an LP? And we were like, fuck, you know, what can we do? And I think they ended up doing a double LP. I I could be wrong, but that we were running into a situation where, you either had to cut songs or they might put it on a, a, a dual LP. I forget what we ended up doing, but the idea is that we had to like kind of trim the thing down. And at the end of the day, it's still, you know, a great representation of who we are and what we are. I don't think we cut off anything important other than, you know, it would have been fun to hear Frank's bullshit that he <laughs> likes to talk so much. <laughs> Look, you can hear your. I'm a bass player too, and and you can hear nice. your your bass guitar work very clearly through that through the recording. Awesome. So, awesome. we you obviously had a lot to say in regards to how the live album was mixed. Yeah, killer. Yep. I mean, yeah. basically the the capturing of the audio and the the mixing of the audio, even the layout of the album, it's all me. You know, I said to the guys, "Hey, what do you guys think about a live album?" They said, "Great." So I went ahead and got all the audio, and I said, "Hey." What do you guys think about this engineer to, 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 to mix it? We'll go back and forth with the guy. I think we went back and forth with him like six times or something until we got, you know, just the way we wanted it. And, you know, that's excessive. We probably could have went with the first or second thing that he did. But, you know, being that you got five creative minds, when I thought it was fine, the drummer went, wait, the snare has got to come up. And then when that was done, then, then, you know, Terrence went, well, the guitar solos are too low, you know? And so we had to go back and forth until we got it right. But I do feel that I had a lot to say and a lot to do with actually making it happen. And I kind of fought, you know, with, uh, with everybody, not, not internally in the band, but like, Mm. Hey man, are we going to do this to management? Hey management, can you get this off to nuclear blast and see if they're interested And a lot, you know, a lot of back and forth. 
And then, you know, I got with the photographers and, you know, got the material and then got with the artists and got the album cover. And, you know, I kind of did a lot of it, but it was something that I wanted to, to do to show the world that, OK, we can go X amount of years between albums. But what the world most of the world knows, suffocation is playing abroad. Mm-hmm. You know, some people that are in remote areas, they just say maybe we're sleeping for a few years <laughs> between albums. But the idea is that we're out playing. And if we can show the world that doesn't know what we're doing, that, hey, this is what we've been doing between this life, last album and this next album. So it's just something kind of felt like the right thing to do to just stick something out there. And we, we like it. So we think it's, yeah. we think it's going to go over OK. Oh, it definitely will go over OK. Yeah, I had it on last night as I was making dinner for the kids. And uh, <laughs> it sounds killer. This is a good point. This is a good point. It sounds killer with these things in AirPods as well as it does oh, over, nice. the, over the speakers on the iPhone, which I think is really important. I, mean, I was surprised that yeah. it sounded as good as it did right through a phone. Yeah, big time. That's technology for you. Mm. Because, yeah, back in the day, you used to have, have a decent speaker system or a decent car stereo. And nowadays, like, maybe it's the digital world but out of a phone, it sounded great. In the AirPods, it sounded awesome. Even sounds great out of my little laptop, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, we're just we're just pretty pretty stoked on how it all worked out. When you were listening back to the guitars in particular, was there anything about the way yourself, Terence, and Charlie locked in that I wouldn't say surprised you, but you were like, oh wow, I didn't realize we sounded like that. You know what? Sometimes we we do surprise ourselves. Like we'll come off of a show and you know be like, wow, man, we we played tight, you know, that felt really good. And then to hear a reproduction of that, that show and go, wow, man, this, the boys were locking in, you know, we know that the drummer's on fire and uh, you know, if we can all hear properly on stage, which we've got pretty worked out this late in the game, you know, Mm -hmm. we know what we need in our monitors and stuff. But uh, when we really lock in like that, it's just a really nice feeling to hear it back after the fact and go, wow, you know, we felt really tight. And to hear it go, wow, man, that really felt good. And here's the proof that it is good mm-hmm. because, you know, sometimes you think you might be able to trick yourself and go, wow, I played great. And, and then the other guys in the band are like, no, 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 it wasn't really that good of a night for me where after this, this particular show, we all kind of looked at each other and we're like, yeah, that was a great show. Mm-hmm. And then we got the files from the engineer and we played it back really raw, no real effects or real mix on it. And we all kind of looked at each other and said, this is the one. You know, we still have X amount more shows on the tour and we'll continue to capture them. But I kind of, you know, bookmarked that one mentally and said, OK, we're going to come back to this particular. Five. I think it was a toss up between Dallas and, you know, maybe one or two other ones. But there was something about the the Cambridge show that's like uh, right near Boston in okay. Massachusetts, mm-hmm. East Coast, that we just kind of said, this is the one, you know, and but it's a blast, man, when we all lock lock in and just are all nailing it. It's super satisfying, you know? Yeah. Yeah. What about with with Ricky? Have you had an opportunity to perform live with him yet? Just with him? Oh yeah. Ricky's, Ricky's been doing it with us for, geez, almost five years. A lot of people, you know, if we don't get to your territory, if we don't get to your territory, you know, you, you probably still assume, okay, it's just Frank and you hear rumors or you see pictures on the internet of Ricky and you wonder, has he just done one show? Ricky's done, probably hundreds of shows with the band. He's no stranger. He knows the material. He's he and Frank are actually really good buddies. You know, they get the whole football thing in common and they're just, they're just great. They're cool with each other. Frank's always promoting, you know, the fact you'll even hear it on the live album, you know, Hey, Frank's like, look, you know, I'm stepping down, but Ricky's going to carry the torch. I don't know if you've heard the entire uh, live album, but Mm -hmm. you know, Frank even mentions that Ricky will be taking over in his position right there, passing the torch, you know, literally, so, um, but yeah, no, Ricky's done really, really good. And he's honestly, you know, being a drummer, he had all the the rhythmic stuff down and uh, he's really, really just shaped up as far as uh, his, his tone, you know, cause being a drummer, like we said, he had the timing, right. And he was sharp enough to, uh, you know, to play the stuff. Right. But like lately his sound has just gotten so good. He's gotten really, really good with his, uh, with his, uh, his tones and all that stuff. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Where, whereabouts did you recruit him from? Is he from another band or? Yeah. Ricky's the drummer of a band out of California called Disgorge. Okay. And, uh, a lot of people knew, a lot of people knew that, uh, you know, he was the drummer of this band suffocation and Disgorge had done tours together. 
We've always been friends with him. I used to play in Discourage back in 1996. And uh, so one go. day, uh, you know, Frank on tour in California, talking shit on the mic, saying, I'm not going to be doing this forever. Ricky was at the show, came up to us and said, I want to audition. And we all kind of didn't really take him that serious because he's a drummer, not a front man. And uh, I sent him off. He and I were good friends. I sent him off an instrumental version of, I think, Cycles of Suffering or Cataclysmic Purification. I can't remember what I sent him. And uh, he sent it back. And we were all really surprised how much he sounded like Frank. And, you know, we said, hey, are you, you know, really willing to get out from behind the drum set and front a, a major band like Suffocation? And he said, yeah. And uh, he learned the set, showed up, did the audition. We gave him the spot. He did it for a while. And then uh, there was a brief moment where he wasn't doing it with us. And uh, we went through another guy or another temporary something where Frank came back. And then uh, he came back stronger than ever. And he is now a permanent fixture uh, fronting the band. So next time anyone sees Suffocation, it will be with, with Ricky. Okay, sweet. Yeah. So does that, does that mean you've had an opportunity to work on some songs together? Yeah, kind of Ricky's actually stuff. sang. Yeah, he's Ricky's already sang on the whole. Um, everything that we have for the new live album has been recorded. Uh, excuse me. Pre-production has been done with Ricky. Okay. And you know yeah. when the last studio album we did with with Frank, you know. So let's let's go even one further back. Not the most recent one of the Dark Light, but if you go back to Pinnacle, when we had Frank in the studio for Pinnacle, he's like, "I'm not doing this again." And then, you know, X amount of years went by and we go, Frank, we got an album, get in the studio. And he goes, I told you assholes, I'm not doing this again. And we, we were able to talk him into doing Of the Dark Light kind of against his will. He, he didn't, he, he knew that he was done and uh, he did it, but he the whole time was kind of kicking his scream and saying, all right, you guys, you got lucky. I'm not doing this again. So I told you I wasn't doing it again. You got me. Don't ask me again. You know, I'll, I'll yeah. hang up on you, you know, because he just basically... <laughs> as much as he loved it at a point he's, he's done with it, you know, and he's done his monumental, uh, you know, mark on the scene and you know, what, what he's done on the albums over the years and what he's done live. And we all just respect Frank, you know, for what he'd done. And Hey, if these are the choices that he wants to make, if he wants to stay home, let him, you know, we're, we're going to continue doing what we love. And it's sad to say that in our position, the singer, is kind of not as important as let's say, you know, a Terrence Hobbs mm -hmm. or a really good drummer. And it's, it's, it's bizarre because from the band's perspective, who's fronting the band and singing, as long as they sound like Frank and are on time and doing a good job, we don't think it's that big of a deal, but, you know, go ahead and pull Axl Rose out of Guns N' Roses and see what the world says. They're, they're not going to be so happy about it. So Ricky's got a lot of, proving to do and he's done great you know the, mm -hmm. the fans have accepted him i mean you never really know what people you know they really want to see who they want to see but when they see a good job a job well done they can't really say well that sucked they can say well i wish it was frank but ricky did do a very good job so at the end of the day we're not worried about it but we'll see how the industry you know takes it now that frank is officially stepping down with his farewell in the liner notes of the new live album, it's like, this is Frank's final performance. And uh, if you saw him, great. If you didn't, too bad, because you won't be seeing him again. You know, he won't be making any guest appearances. He's just done. It's done, yeah. <laughs> but that's okay. I think your legacy is assured. I don't think there's any question of that one there. So I think moving right, forward, right. the work that you do with Terry is just going to be a continuation of that. I mean, you've got, exactly. you know, those those early albums are godlike in, you know, I mean, they are the tech death Big time. template uh, from which if those albums didn't happen, I say this to so many people, like you, even bands like Suffocation, that you're in a position where if those albums don't come out, music doesn't sound the same afterwards. It has a significant right. influence. Like I spoke to Cam Lee, for example, last week and I said, look, if you didn't, he's the bridge between the work that Jeff Becerra was doing and then what Chuck did. Yeah. Um, right. So it doesn't evolve unless people like Cam and you guys are doing what you do. But there's something else, uh, which is that you're bass playing. You certainly are. I mean, you can play bass. There's no two ways about it, but you've got a, a, you've got a killer stage presence as well. That stage presence. 
that stage presence you've got, I think, is very important because unless you're looking at something that's visually and aesthetically pleasing from the crowd's right. perspective, especially if somebody's getting a bit older like myself, I wouldn't go near a pit these days. I'd probably get killed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you're putting on a show within a show yourself. So that that technique of playing it like a cello the way you do. Yeah, is that, right. Yeah, is that is that something that is that intentional or is that just something that yeah, you fits know, your play? Yeah. The weirdest thing about that was I, I had a traditional footing, a traditional stance. And on June 6th, 2006, the date literally read 666. We went to a stripper pole, open bar, dying fetus party, 666 party, June 6th, 2006. Open bar, stripper pole, girls, dying fetus was playing, crazy show, crazy party. And, uh, you know, we said, Terrence, let's go. And he goes, no fucking way. I'm staying home and paint my door with goat's blood. I'm not going out, you know? And, uh, that night I had broken both the bones between the knee and the ankle, the tibia and the fibia, multiple spiral fractures, leg was hanging off the side of me. And, uh, that was my main foot that I would keep all my weight on, on stage, you know, in a traditional stance. And, when that leg was broken, I didn't walk for four months. Luckily, it went right back together. So they didn't need to put plates of metal and screws. They didn't need to, to operate. They just, when the guy put it back, when he set it, he did such a good job that I didn't need the surgery for the metal screws and plates and all that stuff. But it took me a lot longer to learn how to walk again. I didn't walk for four months. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, we were on a seven-week tour right when the casts were coming off. We had seven weeks in the North America, Fear Factory, Suffocation, Hypocrisy, and Decapitated. Nice. Super good tour. Like really a, a strong, solid, and seven weeks, pretty long tour for North America. And instead of me going to physical therapy to learn to get my range of motion back and someone to tug on me and tell me these exercises and right when that was supposed to happen, the tour started. So I went out on tour with an unhabilitated uh, leg mm -hmm. and uh, I just had to switch my weight. I'm a, originally a skateboarder by trade. So I had to switch my footing instead wow. of being like this lead foot. Now this is my lead foot. And uh, I switched my stance and the bass was just so fucking heavy that I kind of got this low crouch position and I put the bass on the ground and I went, wow, this is actually kind of cool. This is different. So through, through a mistake or through an accident, um, this new technique had developed. And it's funny because people, a couple of kids in the industry are, are doing it and they didn't break their leg. They're just switching their footing and, and, you know, putting the bass on the ground. Hmm. And uh, it's difficult, you know, if you have a bass, like a warlock or, you know, something that's got a projected bottom, you know, if it's just a strat, you're going to be way too low. You know, the, the base is going to be way too low. And uh, we've had it where the airlines lost all of our shit and we had to play a show and I went to go into my stance and I'm playing somebody's fender fucking P bass or something. And I like literally like put the base on my foot <laughs> because I couldn't, you know, put it on the ground because it was like, you know, not long enough of an instrument. But yeah, so, you know, from this horrible thing came something really cool. And so now that my leg is completely rehabilitated, I have my normal footing and I have this switch stance footing where I put the base on the ground. So yeah, sweet. out of something fucked up, it came something cool. Yeah. Necessity is the mother of invention, as they say. Isn't That's it? right. You know? That's what they say. Yeah. Are you, are you still playing the custom trap tool? I am. I am now playing a custom creature which is one that I designed myself. And uh, if you'd like, I can email it over to you. Um, and it's really cool. fascinating because I drew it in my phone with my finger mm -hmm. and I presented it to the guy at the devil's choice. And I said, can you make this? And he goes, yeah. And I sent him over. If you want after this, um, I can email you these pictures. I don't know if you can fly them in or show them or just for your own personal use, sure. but yeah. it's, it's pretty similar to, uh, let's see if I have it here on this laptop, pretty similar to to the the trap jaw but a little bit different a little bit different as far as um this is headless and uh here we go devil's choice let's see if this may be this is probably a mock-up mm -hmm. let's see i can switch this right here oh no nice. this is yes. a mock-up that's like the neck 
yeah, it's kind of warlocky, but when I drew it, I designed it. Let's see if he's, is there just him building it? Um, not sure if these pictures are as far along him just building the neck and stuff like that. So anyway, either way I can send over the final stuff and, uh, it will be fun. It will be fun to show, uh, you know what I'm playing now, but it's still devil's choice. And, uh, the stuff is killer. That guy just makes such, such good instruments. And I'm fortunate to be working with that guy. Uh, yeah. And he's out of Germany and he's just, he's the greatest, you know, nicest guy, really super good luthier, very open, you know, to try, to try different things because, you know, you could tell Jackson or BC rich or anybody, Hey, will you make me this thing? I've dreamt up and there'll be like, yeah, sure kid. And you know, like, we're just going to make our standard shapes. This guy will work with you and kind of, if he believed in it, go for it. And so he made the prototype, which I played in Europe for, I think 16 or 17 shows. And then he made me my copy. Um, and it sucks because I think the prototype is a little bit sicker, but mine is a little bit overdone 13 piece neck with red heart and Wenge and Ash and maple like bizarre. The guy went all out to have five piece body, 13 piece neck, multi-scale headless unholy trendy pickups and like just, just crazy. the guy went all out and it's a beautiful instrument but i'll send you over some pictures yeah that'd be nice and and the fan fret thing you still liking that is that yeah. a part of it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. the multi-scale fan fret at first i thought this is very odd and uh i think if you played really upright really square it would probably be fucked up but the mm. fact that i played so up and down it just worked yeah it just it just kind of worked and at first i was he goes do you want to do the multi-scale thing and i said no you know every bass i've ever played has been traditional square frets and he goes man man i think you'd really like it you know being that you play such a vertical style instead of playing a, a mm. you know horizontal style you play more upright he goes i think it will work to your advantage and i think it did i feel like uh i feel like i like it <laughs> but unsure of course in the beginning yeah yeah there's always that adjustment period isn't there especially because yeah. 95 percent of bases out there that you can buy off the rack have the square like my music man bases here yeah you know, the square what thing. you're used to yeah you right. just get used to it i play a uh, different and play the same style you do but i certainly play i got taught bass as you see i'm one of those people who actually got lessons as a kid great and, great and i got taught of course back in the 90s you were getting taught by people who played along to shit from the eagles and stuff like that so i got taught to play like right. this i still play right. like this because it's and sure. the fingers you know of course again comfortable but, yeah yeah and it's you, you just you just learn different modes of attack is the word i think and just yep. to be able to sort of yep. cut through the mix particularly as you Absolutely. well know most of the time as a bassist if you don't know the sound guy you can't hear yourself Worst. <laughs> Worst. Yeah. That probably happened a ton of times to you, has it? Where you, you've just been in, like in the beginning. In the beginning, absolutely. You know, and it's like I kind of learned, you know, you gotta have a good direct box, maybe carry your own microphones with you. And I mean, God, of course it helps to uh it really helps to have um, you know, your own engineer with you to make sure that you don't get left out. Because yeah, if you go and you play a show they usually think, okay, let's get the drums and the vocals and the guitars mixed and bass is kind of like the last thing they need to worry about. As long as there's a little fullness, um, as long as there's a little low end underneath there, then they're good enough. But you know, people like me, I want my attack to be heard. I don't want to be buried in the mix. I mean, I don't need to be the loudest guy, but I definitely don't want to be inaudible, you know, so mm. having your own sound man or, or being able to bring your own microphones and your own DI boxes and, when, when we don't have an opportunity to bring a, a live engineer with us, I go make real nice handshake and talk to the engineer and tell him, Hey, look, mm. you know, we're not one of those bands where you can just bury the bass. You know, I'm going to give you a pretty driven signal. If you can get me, you know, slamming with the kick drum and then put the guitars and the vocals on top of us and, you know, like try to always just communicate with them. Cause if you say nothing to them or you are rude to them, they're going to fucking ruin your night. Yeah. You know, you won't yes. even be heard. So and also when you try to counteract them and you go, well, I'm just going to be really loud. You're going to be so loud coming off the stage that they're not going to put you in the PA, you know? So that's a trouble too, you know? So you can't think, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll fool him and crank yeah, it, it doesn't up work on stage. Yeah. yeah. You'll rip everybody in the front row space off, but you won't even make it into the PA because you're too loud, you know? Yeah. So Talk, talking about ripping everybody's face off, until I watched a video of you talking about it, I didn't know that PV were doing a mega mini series. It's a thousand watts. 
fantastic. Um, just yeah. little suckers, bad out. Yeah. Was that, how, how did you, are you, have you still got a deal with Peavy? Is that how yeah. it works? Yeah. Was that through David yeah. Ellison or how, how did you get that? Sort um, of? We we were with Dave in the very beginning and uh, Allison, greatest dude, greatest dude, um, such a good AR guy. And right now we're working with Chris Kelly over there, who's fucking fantastic. Just best dude, great guy, believes in the band, a uh, good friend of ours. And uh, he was taking care of our guitar players because we play the, uh, the 6505. Uh, it's at the plus. Yeah. The 6505 plus guitar head. And, uh, and then we went down to, to South America and they had these little miniature versions of the guitar amp. And mm-hmm. we couldn't believe how badass they were. They're literally like a third of the size of a normal guitar head came fit on screen. You know, the guitar amplifiers, this, these little things are like this big and they rip. So, um, at the same time, when they were coming out with the mini series, you know, Chris Kelly had presented to me, he goes, yo, we're putting out the mini mega or the mega mini. I'm sorry. I always say that backwards, but the PV mini mega, and it's a beast. It's like six or eight pounds, but it's a thousand watt RMS. And I was like, you're kidding little class D rig. And I mean, I'm running, I can run eight tens. I can run 16 tens off this one little head, you know, like two stacks. Yeah. I like to run a head per stack. So it's too odd, but, um, is it? Must be too. Uh, too I'm not odd. sure the impedance on it. it. It's just badass little head for how small it is. Mm. It cranks. It sounds great. It's very versatile. A lot of little extra options that I don't even take advantage of that, that would be neat, you know, if you needed to, but uh, yeah, it's great. It's very easy to travel with. I've turned a lot of other bass players onto it. They go, wow, what the hell are you playing? That little tiny thing. And it just sounds great. So yeah, I love it. Yeah. P- I wish I could show you, I wish I could show you my rig, but it's over there. But um, I'm using a Galleon Kruger 2001 simply because it's, it's 1100 Watts, I think. And you can't go wrong. Well, there's, there's just too many, especially with five string, you get this. If you're using yep. something that's off the rack, sort of 400, 600 watts or whatever, it doesn't do Underpowered. the job. Yeah, it doesn't shit. work. Yeah, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't work. work. It breaks up. But, yep. but most of the manufacturers, they sit in that sw- that manufacturer sweet spot of between six and 800 watt, four, sorry, four and 800 watt. And I just find that, you know what you do, you end up, you end up overdriving everything. And so you get that distortion when you don't want it. It's a signal that's sort of unnecessary that's, distortion. Yeah. 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 It's, and it's, it's horrible. And my playing, see, I'm playing cover. So I'm playing Kylie Minogue and Eagles songs and Beatles songs and Queen and this sort of sure. stuff. Sure. You, you need a consistent full tone. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say, so the courtesy of, of you, I'm actually going to investigate that because I mean, my, my, the other thing is my rig weighs, I think you guys don't use the kilogram system, but uh, you go in uh, pounds or what have you, but it's fucking heavy, man. Yeah. And it's, yeah. eventually it's going to pull my back out. I need somebody to help me Big time. take everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. I used to play really heavy, physically heavy, not audibly heavy, but the physical weight, you know, the, to get, to get, you know, 1200 Watts or 1100 Watts, they have big transistors or, mm. you know, these heads are massive. They weigh a lot. They're physically large. All of a sudden these little class D amps that are tiny uh, sound great, you know, and they're, they're consistent, you know, thousand RMS, thousand Watts RMS in a little tiny package. I didn't believe it at first. I said, yeah, right. That little thing can't rip. And I plugged the thing in and to my surprise, I was blown away. So I haven't, I haven't used that heavy, physically heavy amplifier since. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know it's, it's just out of necessity at the moment, but when the, the technology is clearly catching up for us, yeah. those flows yeah. uh, to, to allow us to be heard through stuff, which is relatively compact and it's just a nice time to be alive from that perspective. Yeah. Big time. Mm. I agree. Mate, I'll, I'll wrap things up. Thanks so much for doing what you've been doing. Um, My did you, no worries. Well, it's been a great conversation. Congratulations on an outstanding career and for such great base work too, man. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks, brother. All the best with everything. Well, there you have it, ladies and gents. My conversation with Derek Boyer from The Mighty Suffocation. If you enjoyed that chat... There are many more just like it over at scarsandguitars.com. And on that note, if you could like, subscribe, share, and all of that bullshit, I'd appreciate it. Even better, leave a comment. Leave a nice comment, though. Nice is better than not nice. You know what I mean. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith, and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast series. Until next time, it is a very goodbye for now.